And uh, I'm not the president, I'm your patron. patron. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Eva, excuse me. Patron. Otherwise, um, I'll be in trouble for pinching somebody else's uh, role. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd be president, it's up to me. Um, <laughs> Uh, and Eva's going to present um, the results of a survey that was done on the opinions of our members um, last year. Um, Eva, I think, is probably pretty well known to, to, to all of you. She's a public commentator, um, she's a community change agent, and she's a well known as a feminist. Um, she uh, presented the Boyer Lectures in 1995. Um, she's run research consultancies, she's worked as a public servant, uh, and a political advisor, and has written widely on a range of political and social issues. So thank you, Eva, over to you. Thank you. Yes, I'm your patron, which is a rather strange position, but as a patron, I agreed to be the patron, until I was actually uh, following Gough Whitlam as the last one, I think it was, that they had, they had a gap. And I thought, well, I'll have to do something fairly stirry if I'm not going to be a sort of passive patron. So one of the things I was trying to do was find an issue which I thought, because I have a sort of broad view of things, would be something that the Fabians could pick up and run on because I just felt the progressive side of politics wasn't getting very far. So I convinced the executive to do a survey and we sent it out to the mailing list, which has got some 6,000 emails on it, ex-members, current members and interested people. And we sent out this survey and unsolicited. And we got 600 odd responses back, which is actually very good because it usually it's, a, you know, it's usually about 2% on unsolicited surveys. So getting what was basically six or 7% back and we had some problems with it, otherwise we'd have got more, was really an indication of some serious interest in the, in the topic. We had four questions one was about, this was done actually last May, vaccines, research, etc and who should be providing them. Control over private hospitals or hospitals generally in the healthcare system to meet crises. Stop privatizing essential services because that had been raised as a, an issue where lots of people were against that. And, you know, looking at the needs to sort of reclaim the fact that we should be making more things and particularly community, uh, particularly healthcare type stuff, PPE and various other ones and community services privatisation, which at that stage wasn't so much of an issue, but since the actual pandemic has become a big issue because of the aged care type stuff and the privatisation there. We got the responses back and there's a lot of voluntary things. It took a while to actually run them through and find the responses. But what was really interesting was, I used to teach research methods too, so you'll have to put up with me being a bit boring about it, um, was the fact that when you looked at the responses, somewhere between 70 and 90% of people approved that we should do something about pri the privatization of those five or so issues. And that's an extraordinarily high <coughs> response rate, even though obviously people in there were sort of responsive, but there was a quite a wide swing across the various branches. And there was also quite a spread geographically <laughs> Uh, of people and quite a reasonable <coughs> gender split and age split as far as we could work it out because some of the people were known to be older but not too many young ones. So I was very keen to sort of follow it up. We put out a report and I think I sent one around, I don't know whether it has been distributed, but then it sort of got stuck in the system so I don't quite know what we're going to do. There's, we talk, had a, a discussion at the last executive meeting of actually getting ahead and doing something. But I think it's one of those neglected areas that progressive side of politics really is ignoring the fact that a lot of people are extremely angry about what's happening. And that came through very clearly in the answers. We gave them open-ended questions. There's a full range. They weren't pushing anything in particular, but they were sort of, they, I mean, they gave us a strong response to those. But when we asked them for other things, it was obvious that they'd learnt their objections, often in the workplace and often from other people. So... I'm really keen for the Fabians to possibly be a bit more positive about doing something and promoting something which is not on the agenda and not just pushing up the ideas. I have a few arguments for some members of the executive on this, but I won't sort of go into that now. 
because I think the progressive side of politics needs to look as though it's picking up on A, some of the social issues and B, to move out of the bare economic type stuff because I think the people have just sort of starting to block their ears on a lot of that stuff because it just goes on and on and on. The people are fascinated by it, find the fascination, but a lot of people don't. So I was delighted when I saw the Victorians were going to do something. So I sort of offered to come and started off. So I'm here to encourage you and I'm delighted to hear the, the things there. The people start looking at it because <coughs> the aged care stuff is going to be coming out this week. So there's going to be a fuss about the mess that they're making because of the fact that so many nursing homes have been privatised. And I think there's, given the fact that we will have an election either late this year or early next year, it would be a very good idea to get the progressive side of politics to pick it up because I think there's an awful lot of people out there that would vote for something after the experience of the uh, pandemic, which has proved that public health works, that the public sector works, and that we need to do something about this privatization, which has become a serious barrier to a more equitable society. And that's what we need. So that's where it is. So I'm here to wish you luck. I'm hoping to hear lots of things afterwards about what everybody's going to do and go and do. And I'd be quite delighted if we did actually do something very positive about trying to move us back to the idea if anybody of you did ever read my boy lectures that we can create a more civil society, we need to stop being customers get back to being citizens and start talking about our entitlements as part of the process and give up on the fact that the market is actually a better provider of fairness and equity than a mixture of government and community. So over to you and thanks for inviting me. Thanks, thanks very much Eva. Uh, that's a great great scene setter for our for our series of, of three events of which this is the first. So um, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, if, if you survey Fabian members, well, you would expect that they're all against uh, privatisation, but it's interesting that it's also hugely unpopular for the population in general. No one has ever wanted it, and no one has ever seen anything good about, uh, good in it. So um, the most of recent opinion poll I could find of the public opinion was in 2015, um, and by a large margin, the respondents um, to that didn't think privatization helped the economy. They didn't think it freed up money for other things or made things better run. And they did think it increased prices and mainly benefited the corporate sector. So, you know, they probably think pretty much the same as people on this call think. It's a general opinion in the population. And uh, recently in Victoria, we've had a dramatic demonstration of why it's unpopular uh, and how it can go wrong with the failures we've seen in private security and quarantine uh, hotels and private nursing homes. And yet we've had, I think, about four decades of privatization in Australia. So to help us try to understand, you know, what, why is this, what's happened, where do we go from here? Um, and particularly with this, with a focus on, um, on services, uh, we, we've got two outstanding authorities on, on this subject who've, who've thought a lot about this and have thought, thought a lot about its application to services. Just to let you know, in future events, the next event after this will put more of a focus on, on infrastructure, uh, privatisation of that. Um, and then in our final event, we are hoping to get a very, uh, to, to look at the needs to expand rather than roll back the role of the state in, in certain key areas. Now, just to let you know how we're going to operate tonight, uh, the usual thing, we'll be taking questions via Zoom chat. Um, so please submit your chats, which could be questions or comments at any time. Um, and uh, as we, when speakers have, have finished speaking, we will attempt to pick out questioners who, who've asked questions that reflect the main themes that, that emerge. Um, and also just to preview that after the formal meeting tonight, uh, you are all invited to get yourself a drink and some nibbles and join us in the online pub. Uh, and there'll be more details on that when we get to it. Now, our first speaker tonight is uh, Graham Hodge. Um, Graham is a Monash adjunct professor and was professor of law at Monash University. Um, his research has included public-private partnerships, 
privatization of public sector enterprises, outsourcing, contracting out government services and regulation. And he's been published widely on these topics. He's worked in both the public and private sectors, including for the OECD, the European Commission, the United Nations and Australian government. So we're very, very pleased and honored to have um, Graham here tonight and over, over to you, Graham. Thanks very much, Jeff, for all that uh, trumpet blowing. Um, now, I presume I'm loud and clear. Indeed. So I first started um, thinking about privatisation in the, in the mid or early 1990s. And I want to use tonight's uh, opportunity to, I guess, think out loud and take you through the journey that I've been through with my ideas. I mean, when I look around, some of the debates that we're having today still repeat well-rehearsed arguments about good government is small government, about uh, the private sector is always and, and always will be more efficient than the public sector and so on. But I think our debates have also uh, evolved and I welcome sessions such as this uh, as a fantastic opp opportunity to think about um, some of the important issues that accompany this question of, of ownership of public versus private um, and get on to uh, the use and abuse of private power to influence politics, the place that regulation plays in our debates these day, days in pursuing the collective good or the public interest, as us old-fashioned people call it, um, and the place of transparency in uh, public decision making and for that matter in private decision making as well but I'm jumping ahead I, I looked at the international the early uh, international experience and I think it pays to go back and have a, a think about the lessons that we learned or perhaps we should have learned so I'm going to do that and I'm then going to um, think about our more contemporary experience perhaps to ask that question, to what extent do our, uh, do those old lessons still hold? Um, and indeed, you know, is the topic of privatisation really kind of old hat, which I've also heard. What I want to argue is that the lessons about the effectiveness of privatisation uh, are commonly misunderstood, sometimes purposely misrepresented. I've heard lots of people, for example, say, you know, everyone knows that privatisation is an efficient and effective economic reform. Uh, services usually improve. Outsourcing public sector services works well. And I guess the problem with those three statements is that they're wrong, in fact, wrong through naivety and wrong because they're not evidence-based. So I think it pays to go back and have a look at the, what the research evidence says uh, internationally, perhaps um, more so than Australian, mainly because uh, there was no, no Australian statistical studies around. So I looked at the international experience and then think about our contemporary um, situation and how all of that is relevant to modern essential services. There's always been an overarching question for researchers, and I'm nice to hear Eva used to teach research methods. Um, we peas out of the same pod there. There's always a, 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 a research question to ask about what exactly is new here? Are we seeing history repeat itself or, or are there new things that we need to get across? Um, and are there other more important questions or other in, important questions as well as this question of public or private? Uh, ownership. So one of the first things that I learned when I started my research was that, you know, you can choose a case study to, and you can choose a set of performance criteria to show that what you believe is true. If you're a person that says privatisation is morally wrong and uh, it fails to deliver promises, then you choose, you choose case studies like British Airways, which, um, was known as bloody awful BA after it was done. You choose case studies like uh, Cochabamba Water Wars in Bolivia, where there was a guaranteed 15% given to international investors on a 40-year concession. Rainwater 
itself was privatised. The private company was given control over all water resources. The whole country ended up being plunged into a state of siege. Uh, people were killed when police fought the army. The fellow that led the protesters uh, eventually became president of Bolivia. And in the end, the uh, contract was um, destroyed and the investors left the country. The privatization wars, the water wars, they call them. You could also pick on Russia's experience where um, under Harvard universities, conflicted advice conflicted because they were investing in the whole thing anyway. Uh, assets were stripped by the managers, industrial production fell by 60%, poverty increased tenfold. Let me just say that again, poverty increased tenfold. And uh, Russia now has a level of inequality, you know, comparable with the worst in the world, if you, if you read Joseph Stiglitz book. 71% of Russian organisations are now reputed to make corrupt payments to the mafia. Privatisation there became widely known as briberisation. So there's a whole bunch of examples that you can choose that are just shocking. On the other hand, if you're a hardened believer, then you choose a case study where, according to the criteria, and remember, there's lots and lots of goals that governments have put forward for privatisation. I stopped counting when I got to 43, literally 43, and they're in my privatisation uh, book. But you choose the goals and you choose the criteria that, that suits your, uh, your belief. For example, if we're a hardened believer, we look at the, the Victorian electricity privatisations and we said, look, in the short term sale, uh, citizens of that state got several billion dollars more than their assets were, were valued at. Efficiency of power stations over the next days increased and so on. And there were price reductions of 10% that occurred at the time and so on. And that all of those factors indicate success. You could also, as the power companies did, um, strongly for a decade, look at the number of people switching companies as some kind of proof that, that the competition was working and markets were delivering uh, good prices to people. Now, the fact that you can choose a case study to support your own beliefs leaves researchers with a dilemma, of course, um, because if you're trying to answer the question, does privatisation work, as I was doing, you need to be careful. Not only do you need to expand the question, does, does privatisation work to the question, does it work for whom? But what you need to do is to try and uh, undertake a study in a, a systematic and a, a transparent way. I'm probably the only person in the globe that's been crazy enough to look at 400 odd studies of privatisation around the world and make a systematic summary of those using statistical techniques. And I agree with that dog in the background that was uh, ask, struggling to ask me a question on it. Um, so I looked at privatisation as sale of enterprises and I also did the same yelling. for outsourcing. <laughs> <laughs> I I I hear the dog is yelling. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, I can't help myself to turn it on. <laughs> My data was international because there were, as I say, there were no local statistical studies. Um, and it was mostly date, dirty data, which Eva and I would know, <laughs> poorly controlled studies. But, you know, some of these results are pretty strong. So there's a question there. What did we learn? I looked at 162 studies of enterprise sales. And yes, you find labour productivity gains. Yes, you find financial profitability improves. And yes, you find efficiency improvements. But you also find the same things in companies that weren't privatised, that remain in state ownership and were just reformed. So you've got this delightful dilemma. The before and after studies say privatisation improved, but actually the before and after studies of state-owned enterprises that weren't privatised at the same time give similar results. Firstly. Secondly, Despite the rhetoric, there was no simple economic link between economic growth and privatisation. So the companies that privatised more did not experience 
greater economic growth than the companies that, that privatise less. Okay. Thirdly, consumer promises often weren't met. One of the big surprises to me was the, nut, the few studies that were actually done, the few political institutions that gave a toss to study how consumers fared or citizens, how citizens ended up. Fourthly, and this is an important one for me, one of the things that I found was that regulatory intensity and pro, uh, public accountability mechanisms seem to be much stronger influences than the change in ownership. And I'll come back to this question later on. You know, maybe ownership matters, maybe it doesn't, but those two matters, regulation and public accountability mechanisms seem to have much more powerful effects than ownership. So, you know, you might ask why economists are, are obsessive about ownership. The other thing was that there are there was a pervasive theme of winners and losers under this policy. You know, winners were the new shareholders, executives, and consultants. The losers were usually citizens, the old owners, customers, and even countries as a whole in some instances. There are some fantastic examples where an entire country, such as um, Argentina, when it privatised its telecommunications, it, the country was made $4 billion worse off. But the gains on the New, new York Stock Exchange of $6 billion meant that as a whole, it was seen as an economic benefit, a rather shocking travesty of economic stupidity if you forget to ask who the winners and losers are. I also commented in my book on the observation that privatisation was usually associated with increasing levels of inequality. And I support Eva's uh, comments for, that she's made for a long while about um, the need for us to govern with an eye on not increasing inequality. So in the case of outsourcing, I also looked at 232 empirical studies from across the globe um, that made something like 24,000 measurements. So this wasn't a small task. We're not talking about you know, a couple of samples here. We're talking about 200 studies. What did I find in contracting out and outsourcing? Well, firstly, on average, there were some statistically significant cost savings possible. If you added up all of the studies that have been done across all services, there seemed to be some kind of sense that it was possible to save money, 6%, 12%, depending on the way that you did your statistical averages. Most of the data that I looked at came from uh, local government. A lot of it came from the US or UK, so it was limited. But the trends of what I was finding were clear. The interesting findings, though, were not these broad ones. The interesting finds were that it was, much, it, was, it was possible to make large savings in some areas, cleaning, maintenance, garbage collection, 20 to 30% savings. But at the other end, there were no significant cost reductions across many areas of the public sector, across police, across health, across corporate services, IT, and so on. The savings there varied from, you know, you might save five or eight percent up to it might cost you 25 or 28 percent more. As a statistician, I should say an amateur statistician or a person interested in stats, um, it was also interesting that I found the services were heterogeneous. In other words, just because outsourcing might work in one area, like collecting up the garbage, there was no guarantee at all that it would work in other areas. In other words, services are very different. And to the humanities people and research folk, perhaps that's not a big deal. But as a, a statistical finding across the globe, I thought that was important. I also observed that uh, whether you contracted in-house or contracted out, um, both areas actually save money. And that started me thinking, of course, perhaps it's not the sector providing the services that's the really crucial issue here. Perhaps it's just the introduction of competition and it's the introduction of cost information that's encouraging people to be more efficient rather than private or public sector. So interesting stuff, perhaps. Um, you can't read 400 studies and fail to come up with some other pretty strong themes. So let me cover some of those other strong themes. One, one major issue for um, evaluators has always been this question of what is the counterfactual? Now, if I say this has worked or hasn't worked, what exactly worked 
compared to what? What is the counterfactual? Um, is it some, some memory of the past, which we often hold as romanticized memories? My um, dad was a PMG and more recently telecom technician, phone technician. And I, I love to think about Australia's golden age of state-owned enterprises. So is, that, is the counterfactual that kind of personal romantic memory or is it, is, it our, is it our own version of how the country should run if we were uh, prime minister? Or if everything was perfect, is that our version of the counterfactual? Or is it as it should be, which is what would probably have happened had this privatisation activity not occurred? And that, of course, is extraordinarily difficult to, to try and evaluate usually. Anyway, be that as it may, there are lots of lessons for us to think about as we look across these 400 studies, and I'll tackle a couple of them. Firstly, I have to say, strong communities need both strong government and a private sector, a strong private sector. In the late 1980s, we saw the, you know, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and almost total failure of, of centrally controlled economies. And lots of people were walking around saying, look, this is a triumph of capitalism. Um, but that's misleading, isn't it? I mean, Henry Mintzberg said in the US, one of the fathers of modern management said, capitalism didn't triumph at all. Balance triumphed. In other words, we learned that you need a vibrant, to, in today's vibrant and healthy modern community, you need a strong private sector and you need a strong government sector as well. You need a mixed economy rather than the domination of one sector over the other. So the role of government these days is obviously fundamentally about that balance. And one's assessment of privatisation depends on where you, you know, where you draw that balance, I guess. So second theme, the relative economic gains from privatisation to me were actually surprisingly modest. They have continuously been surprisingly modest. I mean, there's obviously a, a kind of an immediate cash flow benefit, sure, but um, and yes, there's there's increased business confidence and you know money markets and so on. Um, but the much touted productivity and financial performance gains were were more difficult to find. I mean, my own meta analysis, yes, there were some gains, but they were pretty they were pretty modest. And in hindsight, the initial policies that were made were clearly overblown. Um, but notice, notice how you can play that finding across both sides of politics, right? If, if you're a privatisation supporter, you might say, well, yeah, the gains were modest, but look, you know, it was a success because we got it out of the hands of government and that leaves governments to develop policy and, and regulation and do the work that they should be doing. And if we're a privatisation critic, we can say that the specific policy promises that you made weren't delivered. So this is a story of broken promises and it's a failed initiative. Third lesson for me, privatisation was as much about power, influence and social change as it was about economics. I naively thought that my privatisation research was going to be about economics, but of course, it's only part of the story. Uh, and even when you read the early, you know, famous UK privatisation story, I was struck by the, the observation that there are initially no explicit economic goals documented. Privatisation origin, originated as a political strategy, as a financial strategy, and the economic rationale was appended later on. Um, whether it was Margaret Thatcher battling the battling the coal miners in the mid 80s or whether it was Jeff Kennett busting transport and ambulance workers in Victoria, government privatisation policy in many instances was about altering the power balance, not just about economics at all. So what I'm saying here is despite the, the rhetoric and the bluster, there are no calculations, there are no equations proving which parts of government ought to be in private hands, which parts ought to be publicly owned. It was all contestable and it darn well still is all contestable. Um, you know, perhaps the redistribution of power away from tram unions was inevitable, but you know, we probably traded excess union influence of government for 
uh, excess influence of capital through banks and and businesses. We certainly traded the promise of future benefits for large actual cash flows immediately and benefits for chosen advisors and merchant bankers and so on. So we've made some trade-offs during this time. All very interesting, game, eh? but isn't this history? I mean, how is this all relevant to today? Well, I think it still is relevant because the question now is what's changed? What's changed in the two decades since I did my research? To be fair, Australia avoided most of the corruption and avoided many of the, the shortfalls that occurred in overseas countries as far as our privatisation processes went. They weren't perfect, but they were pretty darn good as far as the process went. What's interesting for me, though, as a researcher is to, is to see the way that privatisation findings over the last 20 years have broadly been have, in, have broadly confirmed exactly what my meta-analyses found around the year 2000. Lots and lots of studies have been published confirming that governments overpromise uh, when they sell off a privatised enterprise, that governments shouldn't be surprised when privatised companies back with everything monetised and very short-term financial goals. Uh, governments shouldn't be surprised when they contract out services. They sometimes save money but often risk poorer services. And they also risk outsourcing their own brains. They ought not be surprised. So the economic work of the last 20 years really has, has confirmed these earlier findings, which is heartening. But what have we seen since then? Well, you know, in Victoria, we've seen privatised state electricity, market operating, we've seen train, train franchising, public private partnerships. I really regard uh, infrastructure PPPs as just the latest chapter in privatisation because you're using private finance. Um, and my early conclusions on that, that PPPs are politically successful but financially dubious, have also been confirmed. At the national level, uh, we've seen the progressive privatisation of lots of airports, banks, progressively um, Centrelink outsourcing and, and so on as well as nursing homes and education, some of the things that we've already been mentioned. What consistent patterns do we therefore continue to see? First, we do see this, this continued pattern of a need for a balance between the public and private sector. But where's the best, where does the balance best lie? And that's perhaps the current question. We, we almost worshipped markets for a while in, in the early 2000s, but that came to an abrupt halt with the global financial crisis when we were reminded that financial markets really didn't, had no interest in serving customers. Their interest was a self-interest. Um, we watched credit agencies playing the same game, having no concern for the public interest, concern only for their own interest. And we also, we also noticed the rhetoric of... Uh, of risk management being turned on its head because all the contracts and all the risks that were there somehow required governments to come to their rescue after the GFC. Does that risk management experience remind you of our own response to the global COVID pandemic, by the way? Of course it, of course it does. Second theme, we saw a continuation of those overblown promises made. Train franchising in Victoria, I recall, uh, was going to save us $1.8 billion. That evaporated within three years. The prison privatisation program, sorry, the prison PPP program promised improved services and accountability, uh, but it delivered much less. The promise of privately financed public infrastructure, in theory, was going to give us cheaper infrastructure. Uh, and I've been asking for the proof of that for the past 15 years, and I haven't seen one shred of evidence that that is indeed the case. So I guess this policy, this continuous policy bluster is something that we, we live with. I remember giving a, a seminar in Canberra early on um, about my research and we went outside and answered some media questions. And they said, look, you know, the federal government's just announced the whole of government IT outsourcing program, and it's going to save us a um, billion dollars. Do you think that'll happen? And I said, well, my research suggests that they'll probably save approximately nothing, actually. So no, I don't think that'll happen. 
Um, I had to wait. Uh, next day, of course, in the paper, you know, academic says, no, the feds won't save the money. I had to wait five years before there was an Auditor General's inquiry into it, before the Humphrey Review came out and before there was a Senate inquiry. The Senate inquiry in the end found that the savings were about 3% of the initial figure announced. They might have saved 20 or 30 million out of their billion. So far more modest than the, the overblown promises. It seems to take us a few years to learn lessons in politics if it doesn't suit us, doesn't it? Um, we've certainly need, seen the need for more intelligent and effective uh, regulation. We've had the, we've had the Essential Services Commission uh, in in charge of Victoria's privatised electricity. The charade of competition at the retail level was lifted when Ron Ben David, our former Essential Services Commissioner, wrote a piece in 2015, not. 2000, but 15 years after the privatisation had occurred, he wrote a piece saying that the effect of the, the electricity market is broken. He was the insider starting to tell the truth. Actually, he was a bit more provocative because what he said was, if the retail energy market was competitive, then Lara Bingle is a Ru Russian cosmonaut. So he, he was provocative, but he got his message across. When you end up with some of the world's highest prices rather than reduced prices, it's hardly a longer term success, isn't it? We also recall during that 20 year period that relationship between governments on the one hand and businesses on the other um, are enduring. They have a, a, an enduring interdependency, which I might come back to. Um, my conclusion therefore is that privatization is not, not yesterday's topic um, at all. The conclusion from, from our electricity was that um, the independent regulator, which was introduced under this kind of idea of the 80s and 90s that governments needed to be disciplined by independent techno technocrats, the logic of discipline, as political scientist Alistair um, Roberts said, um, having regulators there was itself not enough. They needed to be strong and effective regulators. They needed to be dominated not just by economists that uh, dwell in the land of mathematical, simple ideas, and uh, we're only just now learning that human beings are human and not utility maximising computers. Um, so our regulatory arrangements needed to be stronger, and they were probably one of the most critical pieces in the new jigsaw. I think, I think we also saw in that time governments learning a bit more about outsourcing. I mean, outsourcing delivers this sort of sense of governments getting more control over services, but it's, it's only an appearance of more control. I mean, governments um, have flexibility to buy services, that's right, but it usually comes with constraints. It comes with cultural constraints of the commercial consultant. Um, governments have long needed reminders that, that they're more than a commercial entity. And they ought to be adopting richer values than just economics, as Eva said. Um, if you look at Victoria's experience with quarantine hotels, my worry there is that the need to outsource wasn't even decided. It was just simply assumed. I mean, everyone knows that governments outsource. Um, what drives that? Behavior. Well, if you're a cynic, I guess you could say, you know, it's the consultocracy. It's those consultants whose very job it is to provide um, outsourced information. But I suspect there's a deeper cultural need for relearning to underpin this. It, I think the regulators, I think the public sector itself needs to relearn the lessons of the past and to make those decisions explicit. Um, we've long been debating, haven't we? And I'm almost out of time, so I'll be quick. We've long debated the place of business as against the place of governments. We know there's an enduring relationship there. We know that, you know, Dahl said 60 years ago that it's, it's wide open. The power of decision making is dispersed amongst many groups and many interests and many ideas. We know that Lindblom said 40 years ago that actually that I disagree with Dahl, you know, 
markets are a prison that robs democratic governments of effective choice. Governments rule, but only with the permission of business. Two opposite ideas, and that debate really hasn't been resolved. And it's much more complex than at either of those two extremes, I'd have to say, and thank goodness that it is. But wherever we sit on this, this debate, it's certainly, in, it's certainly time to get back to ask the questions of what should be the influence of capital owners over governments. And how do we watch out for things like transurban coming in with unsolicited bids and offering governments billion dollar uh, mega projects that might help governments look good if it's gonna cost citizens a fortune in doing that. So how does all this relate to our stuff today? How does this relate to pandemics? There's a question about what you mean by essential service, of course, isn't there? To the lawyers, the essential service is, well, essential service is just what it says in the act. If it says in the act, local government is an essential service and electricity is essential service, well, they're an essential service. To me, as a policy scholar, an essential service is what we done well want to be an essential service. And if we define health or education or public houses as a civilised community as an essential service, then that is an essential service. Water has long been an essential service. Utilities have long been essential services. But we expect values. If you think about water, we expect very different values to be applied to water than to buying bananas at the local shop, as a colleague said yesterday. We expect different arrangements for access. We expect water companies to actually have a duty of care for citizens, not just to flog them stuff with movie tickets. Water is very symbolic, but it also, um, I think some of the water utilities are beacons of what I would call an essential service and uh, a public service from my perspective. Uh, it's nice to see state-owned enterprise coming back into fashion, not only because the NBN is there and NDIS are there and so on. It's also coming back into, into academic research uh, as a sensible uh, swing of the pendulum, if it's right. And it's, and it's done well right for us to be disgusted at the antics of Australia Post when they give Cartier watches to executives for simply doing their jobs. As I said to the Victorian Treasury, two decades ago when I was questioning their guidelines for PPPs and how to make decisions on PPPs, I expect far more from my government than simply legal behaviour and commercial acumen. I expect governments to primarily look after the public interest. So privatisation is not yesterday's topic. It's got huge relevance to what we're thinking about now. Professor uh, Matt Flinders, uh, University of Sheffield in the UK, has an interesting comment to make. His, his comment is that it's probably more difficult to make political decisions today than it's ever been historically. How could that be? Well, his argument is that, and I have some, some sympathy for it, his argument is that governments have less and less marginal availability of resources to solve problems because pension payments go up, government services go up and so on. And yet at the same time, citizens expect more. Some citizens have a, a rather high um, magnified sense of entitlement too. Um, we have an increasingly educated citizenry and increasingly capable citizenry to manage um, advocacy and to mount campaigns, gain notoriety. And this difference between what citizens expect and what governments are able to deliver has the effect of an expectations gap. That's his argument. There's an expectations gap here, which governments struggle to manage. Um, and that gap is increasing in size. It's exacerbated, of course, by the existence of a 24 hour media cycle. You know, we've asked you a question, Minister, if you could just get back to us by five o'clock or 4.30 to make my publication deadline, that's my expectation. I've got a lot of sympathy for that argument. Um, Ministers, of course, don't do themselves any favours at all by claiming, as was the case in the UK, um, by claiming expenses on their castle moat for the taxpayer to pay, by, pay that. Our ministers don't do themselves any favours uh, by their ridiculous hypocrisy. Um, 
but there is an expectation gap and I think that's something we've uh, I have some sympathy for this argument. So what it means to me is we've got to go past the old debates and begin asking questions like how effective are our regulators? Regulators grew by four and a half times in the 80s and 90s than the previous perhaps 40 years. Huge growth. And my research said that regula regulation is probably somewhere between four to 10 times more powerful than changes in ownership. They're big numbers. It's not just more powerful, it's 10 times as powerful. Um, we need to ask questions about uh, when regulators act as independent servants of the public, whose values do they adopt? Are they still adopting the values of defunct economists in their decision making? How do we best deal with the relocation of policy debates from ministries and political departments into the regulators, often who are quite technocratic in their approach? You know, we don't make moral judgments here. We just obey supply and, and demand curves, which of course itself is a moral debate, but you've got to educate the economist in order to win that argument. And how at the end of the day, do we help governments relearn some of these older lessons as the pendulum moves across uh, towards a better balance? So these are the sorts of questions that I think are our priority future challenges. Thanks, Jeff. Sorry, I muted myself because I thought the dog <laughs> noise might have been coming from my neighbour here, but <laughs> it wasn't me. Uh, yeah, so th thank you so much, Grant. I mean, that that was um, so interesting and so interesting that you haven't just, you know, given us the standard um, sort of answers. You know, it's it's not a simple question. That the answer is is complex, um, and and your. Um, range of um, knowledge and the amount of um, examples you've looked at is is just absolutely mind-blowing so that is an absolutely fascinating um, talk thank you very much and certainly simulated stimulated a lot of um, of uh, comments and so on in, in the uh, in the chat which we'll come to later when I'll give them some of those people the floor to ask questions and make um, comments um, so now, so our next speaker then is um, David ha uh, David Haywood. Um, David is Emeritus Professor of Public Policy at RMIT University, uh, where he was Dean of the School of Global, Urban and Social Studies. Um, his research interest is the funding of social policy uh, in the Australian Federation, um, and his uh, writings on privatisation uh, the, he, he has written widely on privatisation. Uh, key articles include the privatised city, urban infrastructure planning and service provision in the era of privatisation, uh, as well as a number of articles for The Age and the ABC uh, on the subject. Um, he's observed that for all the cuts and privatisations, government is bigger than ever, um, and uh, asks why Victoria's blood budget splash raises questions about privatisation. So all very topical um, um, uh, material. So um, welcome, David, and we'll look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you very much, Graham, <clears throat> for a stimulating a paper that drew our attention to the mountains of research are available on this topic of privatisation. Um, could I just begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also acknowledge that the land was never ceded. <clears throat> um, look, what I want to talk about today, I'm not going to go into the detail of the research as Graham has done. I couldn't possibly do anything yeah, like that. <clears throat> um, I tried once, Graham, but I just got, <laughs> I just found it was too much. Um, and uh, so, but what I'm going to do is to start with a simple prop. I'm going to test a simple proposition that <clears throat> when all this began, the privatization argument began back in the 1980s, what we were presented with was a promise that <clears throat> if we went down the mark, if we went down the path of setting up markets where previously we had governments and public servants delivering things. Um, if we set up markets and we privatise them, privatise service delivery, <clears throat> we'd end up with smaller government. We'd have less, less spending 
which would lead to less taxes. And if we had less taxes, there would be more money in people's pockets to spend. The economy would go through a growth spurt. And what was even better is that we'd have this libertarian nirvana where people had choice. They could spend their money as they wanted. And so what was given, what they'd end up with was what they wanted rather than what governments want said you need to have to consume. That was the promise. Now, when you look at the evidence, <clears throat> we, we didn't get that. Um, and that's the, that, that's the problem that I've started with the research I've been doing over the last couple of years. We've got this big gap between the promise and reality. And I've been interested looking at some of the right-wing think tanks across the world, how they've come to understand this gap between promise and reality, because They've noticed it too. <laughs> it's not just us on the left, right? So you have a look at the, um, the some of the right wing think tanks in the UK, and they've kind of given up arguing that the consumers are going to be the beneficiaries. They don't argue that anymore. They've sort of said, no, no, we we recognise that didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> but what we've got with markets give us innovation. All right, well they've given up the main premise that the whole thing was put forward on. Um, <clears throat> So that was, that's my starting point. What I want to do today is to kind of plot a path of how did we get from the promise to the reality? What was the process by which we ended up spending more, even though we were promised less would be spent and it would be delivered better? And what we ended up with is something that's actually inferior to what we would have had had we have delivered by government. But I'm going to pursue that by looking at four cases. I'm going to look at, sorry, three cases. I'm going to look at superannuation. Uh, which is really the privatisation of the pension. <clears throat> I look at superannuation, I look at childcare. Eva, Eva Cox is a champion on this area. She's been warning us about this for a long time. And Eva, everything you said would happen has happened. You were right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and childcare and then aged care, because aged care follows a path like childcare. And what I want to do is to give some examples, some extraordinary examples of the, of the failures that are evident in those sectors. And then I'm going to finish with some concluding thoughts. Jeff said to me, David, whatever you do, don't depress everybody, give people some hope. So I'll try and end with a little bit of hope. Because <clears throat> uh, I think there, these are hopeful times. The world is changing, things are shifting. You can feel it in the air. People who were powerful yesterday aren't so powerful today. Even that Bergen inquiry into the, the Crown Casino licence, it said, what on earth has happened to the regulations that were there to protect everybody? Who ever thought that casinos were moral enterprises? What were we thinking to go light touch regulation? This is insane. Anyway, so things are changing and I think they're changing for the better. How much better I think comes back to us, but I'll, I'll come back to that at, at the end. <clears throat> so let me begin with this promise. And interesting enough, in preparing for this talk today, I was just did a sort of Google search for the promise of neoliberalism. And I found a remarkable set of papers from a right-wing think tank in the States called the Niskanen Center which describes itself as devoted to the open society. There's a series of essays where they outline what the promise of the neoliberal movement was. And it's a really nice summary. And, you know, the, the idea is that um, <clears throat> um, if, if, if you um, allow economic freedom to flourish and you allow it to freedom by giving money to people to spend in markets that are provided for by private companies, um, you end up in the best possible world, um, you know, smaller government, less taxes, and the price mechanism can do everything. It's this fantastic thing called price. So if we've got money to spend as consumers and we've got our preferences about how we'd like to spend, we want to buy more oranges, more electricity, more childcare, more aged care, we can choose how much. You want to spend less on one more or another. We just cast our dollar votes and you know what happens? Prices go up or down and so private suppliers respond accordingly. We get rid of bureaucrats, public service delivery, forcing us to have things where we have no choice. And this, this wonderful world. The interesting thing about that Niskanen um, Centre, and I encourage you to read it, is that they go, you know what, it didn't happen. And America is a classic example of where it failed in every respect. Now, that's a Niskanen Centre saying it, right? And I'll let you read them. I'm, I'll, I'll just refer that to you because it's a fascinating bit of work, right? They, they talk about all the way it's failed, all the way it's been captured by private interests. And what was meant to be about empowerment and openness became about closure, preventing information from flowing and about enabling a dramatic redistribution of resources from one section of the society, workers, to another section, the private owners of capital. A massive redistribution of income has taken place. That's Lindsay Brink who's published those pieces, very recently published just last year. 
Anyway, but the promise was, as I said, this small government. Now, if you look at the figures that are available on the growth on government spending, you can look at all sorts of figures and money. When they're talking about billions and billions of dollars, it's easy to confuse people. But the best single measure of government spending over time is spending and taxes and deficits, if you like, as a percentage of GDP. Because GDP, gross domestic product, is a measure of the national income. So that way you can go, well, Australia spends, say, you know, 25% of its national income on government service provision. America, which is vastly bigger, well, they spend a little bit less. Or, you know, so you can make comparisons. It's expenditure in relation to national income. And if you look at what's happened in Australia over time, and I put together a graph today that goes back to 1971, 1971 through to 2019-20. It's actually not easy to do because as the privatisers worked their way through the system, you know what they did midway through? They changed all the measures. <laughs> so you can't easily get a time series. When Victoria moved to a new accounting system, um, when Jeff Kennett was in office back in the late 1990s, they threw all the records away. So a lot of the things you can't measure over time, what things were like before and after, ground zero. But look, you, I put together these data. I couldn't get it from the OECD because they start the time series for Australia in 1998. But I went back to the Australian government's budget papers, gone back to 1971. So just payments as a percentage of GDP. They've gone from about 17% uh, of GDP in 1971, right? 17%. And then by 2019-20, they're up to around about 28%. And a lot, so it's, a, it's an increase. It's an increase that sort of goes like this. Now, if I was there live, I'd go, what do you reckon would account for the sort of like the bumps? And well, in, it's if recessions. If a recession comes, spending on unemployment goes up, uh, all sorts of spending goes up. As things get better, sp the spending stabilizers come down. Same thing on the tax side. That's just looking at the gross numbers. Now, it becomes a little bit more complex because what privatisation has done is the whole era has led to a whole lot of government activity going underground, so you don't see it. And the biggest example of that that we've got is superannuation. Now, I'm a proponent of superannuation. I'm not a defender. I don't want you to misunderstand me. But what happened when we set up superannuation is that we took money that would otherwise be counted on the government accounts and we privatise it. So even though it's a government law that 9% of salary must go into a superannuation account, it doesn't get counted as government revenue. It get, gets counted privately. If you include that, you know how much it adds to the spending equation? If you, if you include the amount spent out on private superannuation payments to superannuants, it adds six and now 7% of GDP to the spend. <gasps> wow. So what I said before means that we're now spending about 35%. This is just the Commonwealth government, excludes the states and the, uh, and the territories and local government. So it's even bigger if you add them too. But the Commonwealth spend is up to around about 35%. Because I don't think you have to include super in there. We've just simply, we've just simply washed our way through, through statistical trickery. <clears throat> that is 17% up to about 35% from 1971 through to 2019. And it's still going upwards. And of course, it's rocketed upwards during the pandemic. So that's one measure of th things didn't get smaller, they got bigger, and they got bigger massively. And then another measure that I'll use, which is quite funny, it's a quite funny measure, but somebody has tried to measure the pages of Commonwealth legislation. So how much gets legislated every year, going back to 1901, going right through the 2017-18, it's Institute of Public Affairs that's done this research. And what they have found, what they've shown is a massive increase in the number of regulations. In the era of deregulation, regulations, we haven't deregulated, we've massively increased them. Like it is phenomenal, the increase. And it's the more that we've said we're going to deregulate and privatise and marketise, the more we've got regulations. There is an amazing conundrum. How did that happen? And it's funny because if you read the people who present this research, they go, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe it's good regulation. Maybe it's regulation that's helped create markets. So maybe that's all right. Well, that's a silly answer, isn't it? You've produced, you've actually done the exact opposite to what you said you do. You said you deregulate, and you've actually got more regulation. So how do we end up with these twin things of big increase in government spending and big increase in regulations? Well, what I want to do now is to move on to look at the cases of how it's, how it's happened by looking at specific examples of social policy and the damage that's been created along the way or the redistributive effects along the way. Now, the first one, which I've, I'll, I'll only cover briefly because I've spoken about it all, already, but superannuation. Look, it's, um, 
the superannuation industry, and it is an industry, um, this has been this has been put together by an economist at Sydney University, but um, he rec if it employs fifty five thousand people at a cost of thirty two billion dollars a year. <clears throat> but fifty five thousand people at a cost of thirty two billion a year. This is nearly as many people. This is a quote from this scholar. This is nearly as many people as the enlisted Australian Defence Force, fifty eight thousand, with a similar total cost of thirty four billion. The rest of the entire welfare system, including administering the age pension, disability, unemployment benefits, and Medicare, costs just six billion per year and employs thirty-three thousand people, while providing forty-five billion in pension benefits. Get the point, right? We're spending a humongous amount of money for very little benefit to the, the people we're meant to benefit from at the superannuants, but a huge amount that's been creamed off by the people private people who are managing the superannuation funds. Now it's estimated by these, these economists that it, you could put back into a public pension system an extra $15 billion a year if you got rid of all those private um, people um, betting on the stock exchange with varying degrees of success as the Productivity Commission has pointed out. You know, even Peter Costello said, look, I've got this great idea. Why don't we get rid of private superannuation and put all the money in the, um, in the, in the federal government's um, uh, uh, sovereign fund? We'll manage it that way. Save a hell of a lot of money, we'll get a much better benefit. So first example of this growth of government is that the decision to privatise superannuation. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's one, right? massive growth. Um, probably mainly to the benefit of the private executives that are running the show and the fund managers who are making a lot of very healthy returns, even if their fund doesn't perform all that well. And I should add, in terms of choice, you don't really get a lot of choice. In fact, what's what the Productivity Commission has said is that um, when people sign up to superannuation, they don't really think about it because it's such a long way away before they get any benefit. So the idea of choice at the front end and even price doesn't mean much. You know, you can't really tell where things are going to be in 50 years' time. So it's really a poor area to try and produce a market that doesn't make a lot of sense. Second area, childcare. <clears throat> um, look, the childcare transformation began in the late 80s, if I remember correctly, Eva. You're much more read, well read than on this than me, but it was a federal Labor government that began this. So the Federal government used to provide capital subsidies, um, uh, capital grant payments, and operating subsidies to mainly not-for-profits and government, local government providers of childcare. It was a, a pretty sensibly developed um, model, actually, where the attempt was to develop local capacity, community-based childcare that was um, it tried to grow a, a workforce that could do childcare really well. So long daycare in particular. And um, the federal government decided they wanted to create markets, so they gradually shifted across to got rid of all of the capital grants and the operating subsidies and moved across to paying parents per child in childcare. And where they said, we don't care whether it's government, non-government or private, it, it, any provider, if they pass a test, can get into the act and can provide childcare and what we'll have is a market. The good thing is if the parents have got the money and they've got to pay, well, they'll look around carefully and if prices rise here, well, they'll pull um, <clears throat> Juliet out of the childcare centre there and put her over there. And, you know, the operators will go, well, look, we've got to have a well-trained workforce or this. So that was how it was meant to go. We, and we had an early example with ABC Learning. Do you remember ABC Learning, everyone? Learning the, two, the, the disastrous case where a giant private operator Eddie Groves, who is a pretty unimpressive sort of character. You think about people who should be running childcare, he, he wouldn't have been on my list of people I'd choose to run childcare, but somehow he managed to have about 700 child, 600 childcare centers, went broke. Um, on the back of all these reforms, on the back of government subsidy, because in the background, government subsidies are climbing up as well as the, the fee caps were deregulated. He didn't, he grew too quickly, went broke, and it was taken over by um, Good Start Early Learning, uh, which was a consortium of not-for-profits that put up the cash to save this failing entity. So we now have um, G8 education, which has taken the place of um, Eddie Goves and it's the biggest private operator. It's got uh, about 600 odd childcare centers. It's got about 8% of the market. Um, uh, there's another one, Affinity, uh, private equity. Private equity firms are owning childcare centers. Think about that. 
they got about 150 to 200 KU Children's Services and not for profit. Guardian. Anyway, there's quite a lot of different owners. It's about 60% private, 40% not for profit, with the big, the biggest not for profit could start early learning. The interesting thing in childcare, if you look and if you paid attention, and you'll know, you'll pick it up in the newspapers. Subsidies keep climbing, right? They've climbed in real terms from something like three billion in 2007-8. They're now up to close to 10 billion. So that's federal government subsidies, a massive increase in real terms. However, you look at it, subsidies have climbed, but prices are rising faster because they're uncapped. That's what it keeps happening. Is the government keeps on giving more money out into the system, which is meant to operate through markets. But they're uncapped, so prices keep increasing beyond the rate of growth of subsidy. So then there needs to be more subsidy increase to make up for the rising prices. It's like a dog chasing its tail. The cost of $10 billion has gone from $3 billion to $10 billion in, in about 10 years. It's a huge increase, um, however you look at it. And um, no one knows who's, who owns what. You know, if you look at the G8 website, that big private provider, they own about 30 different brands. That's how they've gotten so big. They keep buying up other little privates. Now they've got things like Penguin Childcare, Head Start Childcare, Early Learning Services, Pelican Childcare, Kindy Patch Kids. They're names that don't relate at all to G8. So if you were, say if you were thinking, well, no, that's not too bad, how would you know? You went to Penguin Childcare up your road. It doesn't say G8 Education. It says Penguin Childcare. How do they relate to G8 education? How would you know? What early learning, how would you know what early learning was? And one thing I do encourage you to do, have a look at the websites of these private providers in particular. Just Google, um, just Google, uh, do a Google search, uh, um, childcare centre near me. Have a look at what comes up. I bet you you'll see what I did. They've all got innocuous names like Daisy Land Childcare. They, they're meaningless names. And have a look at who the owners are. You'll be lucky to get any information. Have a look at performance indicators on how they're going. What information is there to give you confidence about this being a good provider? You won't find it there. What you'll, you'll find, what you'll end up back with is the regulator's website. And the regulator that's there for childcare is I'm sure Eva, I'll be interested in your views on this, but a very unimpressive regulator. The standards are very ordinary. They do not emphasize children, children's education. They do not emphasize workforce and workforce skills. Um, they're very bland and most of the privates are, um, have only just met what, the, what are required. They're not exceeding the expectations. It's the not-for-profits that are exceeding the, ex exceeding the expectations. Go back and have a look at those child private childcare providers and you'll struggle to get that information. And if you go to the regulators website, that won't help you make a choice either because it's all so bland. But the property market is going gangbusters. <clears throat> Um, Financial Review keeps talking about the, the childcare sector revival is complete. Now, when they're talking about childcare, they're talking about property development in childcare. I don't know about what it's like in other parts of the country, but in Victoria, you see little buildings being pulled down and three-storey childcare centres going up in their place. There's a healthy 4 or 5% return to be had from investing in... Think about that. We've enabled a property market to develop in childcare those part of that $10 billion of federal government money isn't going to children, it's going to the owners of the properties. And if you look carefully, you will actually find examples of childcare owners who have moved into property development in a big way. And that is the real purpose of what they're doing. The children are secondary. The goal is property development. Um, the other thing you might want to do, have a look at the G8, um, have a look at its uh, website, have a look at its annual report. The other striking thing is the pay of the non-executive directors. Now, a board, the board chairman of G8 Education, have a guess what he gets. Have a guess, and it is a hey, but guess what his chair, what he gets for just being the chairman of the board. This is an in an industry that pays, pays its workers between 40 and 60,000. The chair of the board gets $285,000 a year. $285,000 a year. That's just the, the executives take home close to a million. And then on top of that, G8 Education in 2019 paid out $48 million of dividends to shareholders. 10 billion government money. And we've got people working in the sector on 40 to 60,000. They're the core bits, aren't they? That's what makes childcare work, it's the workers. And then you've got at the other end, you've got board chairs 
285,000 and executives on close to a million. It, it's, and you wonder why, why government spending has gone up and service delivery, and you, you don't have a market. Nobody's clear about price. You've got childcare subsidies. Nobody knows prices are through the roof. Subsidies are through the roof. It's a failed. It's a failed government intervention, and it's getting costlier and costlier. That um, brings me to aged care. <clears throat> Look, aged care is a real uh, easy one to hit out of the park at the moment because we've got this royal commission that keeps coming up with these gems about the the shocking treatment of people in aged care. I mean, they literally slammed, they, they did a body slam on this sector. They, look, here's the council's final submission uh, that's gone, because we've got the findings coming out next week. <clears throat> this is These are some of the things that the council's final submission said. In 2018-19, services reported 5,233 allegations of assault. Almost one in two services, approximately 45%, had reported an allegation of assault in 2014-15. This increased to almost two in three residential care services, two or 62% in 2018 19 And it goes on and it talks about the number of sexual uh, assaults. Now, I mean, what, we're not talking about crummy food here. We're talking about um, crime. These are crimes. These, these, are crim these are criminal acts. What, what council concluded is that um, this is shameful. This is a national shame. And, and, yet if, and I could talk to you about the same thing, because you've got the same thing as what's happened in, in childcare, as you know, that aged care subsidy has gone through the roof. It's up to around about 14, 15, 16 billion dollars a year, the aged care subsidy, aid payments. The other thing with aged care, which um, um, is interesting, um, no one knows the price. Have you, have you seen the complexity of the pricing mechanism around aged care? And the names, look, they've got names like um, the basic daily fee. They've got a mean tested accommodation contribution, a means tested care fee, which gives you a total resident contribution. Then there's the government contribution as an accommodation supplement. There's a government funding, uh, some other, uh, there's some other government subsidy. And you've got to kind of put it all together to work out what is, how much is the cost and what is, so how do you know what it, what do you know? You wouldn't know. There's no way you'd know. The terms are too complex. It is all opaque. You know, for a typical person going into age gap, the, the federal government is putting in $75,000 a year. 75,000. The person's putting in 19,000. But you wouldn't know because you can't put the whole thing together and you have no clear idea of price. But what you do know is, Exactly the same thing happens in aged care as in child care. Fifty-five percent is private. Have a look at the operators. The biggest two last last year gave out a hundred million dollars in dividends. A hundred million dollars. You've got the same pattern with executive salaries, non-executive directors, chairman of the board. Then quite often they're men that are dominating. They're men that are that are behind, that are running the show. Women are the ones who work work it. And the, the final thing I'll just add, which I think is particularly amusing, in the Aged Care Royal Commission, because they've got this problem, right? They've got 55% of the sector, the residential aged care is owned by privates. And it costs a hell of a lot of money to, to renationalise that, that lot. So they said they've got Frontier Economics to do a review of the literature and say, well, what would be a fair rate of return for private operators? And they went, all right, well, look at the literature. They read all the literature. And I went, but the problem is when we come up with our, uh, the, looking at the literature and the evidence, we reckon that private companies need a return of about 12 or 13%, right, on their capital investment. The trouble is, at the moment, governments can borrow at 0%. So how can we justify paying private providers 12%? So what they concluded is, we'll just assume that away. We'll just assume that away and just assume that the private operators should get 12 or 13%. I'm just telling you the truth. That's exactly what they did. It's terrible. It really is terrible. I don't know how you conclude, can conclude that when you see the way that the money is being spent. Because you know what? In aged care, exactly the same as childcare. Have a look at the websites. Same thing, big brand and then lots of sub brands. You don't know who owns what. You see some company that gets labelled as, you know, having done a terrible job. You'd have no way of knowing if they own the, the aged care centre your, your relative is in because they all operate under different brands. Got the same thing, no clear price signals and it's, and it's opaque as to who owns the damn thing. How, can, how could consumers, even if they were in the smartest people, how could they possibly work out what would be right for them? They couldn't. It's not possible. 
the money, a lot of the money in aged care, like childcare, like electricity, like all the other markets that have been created, it goes in a sales effort to confuse and deceive. That's what happens. You can see I get worked up by it. I'm very sorry about that. Um, but look, let me bring it to some sort of conclusion. I think we were tricked, right? We saw the promise, we've seen the reality. Let's go hard, let's name it, let's call it out. You, whenever it happens in the as age in the Sydney Morning Herald, they get inundated with letters from people going, this is shocking, it's got to stop. Um, what you find is you get a, a two, two, two things happen. One, public shaming, and then behind the scenes, governments are trying to work out what to do. Very interesting case study of Victoria. You know that case that Graham talked about with the um, private security guards? When the Premier in Victoria, we do have a very impressive Premier in Victoria and a very impressive government in Victoria overall. Um, he, he was asked about how this happened, and he gave an interesting explanation which reflects modern thinking in um, uh, pub, uh, public sector decision making. But the Premier said, well, look, ministers are responsible for making a policy decision. We do this or we do that. That's the strategic level. The operational decisions are made by public servants. What's the best way of delivering it? And he said, we never got involved in decisions about outsourcing. That wasn't up to us. That was up to the public servants to work out the best way of delivering it. And I think therein lay part of the problem that we face. There is a prevailing ethic, or not ethic, but an understanding within the public service that tends towards outsourcing, privatisation, using advice quite often generated by private consultants, those big four private consulting firms, which they hire for the advice, and we get locked into a circle. I'm not pessimistic about all this, so because I think that what's happening is that within the public service, there is a reconsideration that's taking place because it's been one scandal after another, where there's vocational education training. Imagine if I had talked about that tonight, Graham. I mean, that would have brought that house down. I mean, that's the biggest scandal in a generation, really. Um, and I think what's happening, it's at a differential pace um, within the public service. Some are a bit more advanced than others, but they're working at a new regime, a new way of understanding the policy problems that we now find ourselves because they're caught with this dilemma of rising costs and prices, poor delivery, and at the end of the day, even if you privatise it, the um, governments do get eventually held accountable for major policy failures. So I think this is sort of like a watershed. I think um, a welcome. I think it's terrific the Fabians have done this, um, set this, this sort of process going because if ever there was a time to go on the front foot and start challenging and forcing a rethink, forcing people to question, forcing people to come out and capitalise on those surveys, which for 40 years have shown, same thing, people hate privatisation, they hate it. They don't know. If ever there was a time to go on the front foot, now's the time. And with that, I'll bring my presentation to a close. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Thank, thanks very much, um, David. Yes, I, I, um, I asked you not to leave us with a sense of impotent rage. I think you've left us with a sense of rage, but hopefully not impotent. <laughs> that, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so we, um, we're now on to the uh, question and answer. Um, and just let me see. Um, yeah. Um, so we, we've had a lot of um, questions and comments on in the chat, and I'm going to attempt to pull out uh, some of those and, and get people to uh, ask their questions. And um, please continue to uh, contribute through the chat um, as we go forward. Um, also would like to remind you that if you are finding this event rewarding and useful um, and something that really helps uh, is of value to the progressive movement. Um, and if you're not already a member of Australian Fabians, please join because um, that, that will strengthen our ability to, to put on this, this sort of thing. Um, and stimulate the debate on the issues that we all care about. Um, so I'm going to pick out um, a, a few points here. Sorry, just one sec. Um, a little while ago, just quite a long way back in, in the chat, I, we had a question, I think, from Osman Chu um, about reversing privatisation. So I think we've had a sort of quite a nuanced sort of message about, you know, is the issue really to take things back into public ownership? Is it to regulate them better? It seems like, you know, it's obviously, it's a complicated question. It's not a kind of just simple black and white. Um, but I guess that um, probably a lot of us on, on, on this call to, you know, if, if we were honest, would say we want to 
bring it all back, you know. Um, so Osman, if you're there, and if I understood your question correctly, uh, would you like to unmute and um, and speak? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so my question wasn't specifically about reversing privatization, um, though I can just weave in a comment about that quickly. Um, so my question was more about the interaction between things like competitive neutrality and corporatization with privatization and how it all, at least from my perspective, it seems like there is an interaction. So, you know, corporatization and competitive neutrality has sort of paved the way for privatization. Um, so I was just sort of curious about your thoughts on that relationship. Um, but in terms of the reversal of privatization, what I did do was I shared a link with everyone uh, to a global database on um, remunicipalization. So it's sort of being more focused on examples of reversal of privatization um, across the globe. And I have been contributing to that database. And I think part of the thing is there is this perception in Australia that the reversals of privatization have not happened, whereas there actually are, I've, I've helped identify you know, over 40 to 50 cases that I know of um, where it actually has happened. We just think about things like Telstra and, you know, Qantas, whereas there are actually plenty of examples like, you know, prisons in Victoria, prisons in um, Queensland, hospitals in every state have been turned back, have been brought back into public ownership. Um, so they're like, there are plenty of examples. It just seems that there is this perception. It, it hasn't been happening, whereas it actually has been happening in Australia. It just isn't the big picture ones. It's more localised case studies. Who'd like to answer that one? Or... Uh respond? Uh, well, I'm happy to kick it off, um, Osman. I think your point's a really good one. I'm not so, you know what, in some ways, the, um, the it depends on which, what it is we're talking about, whether renationalisation or whatever you want to call it is a good um, <clears throat> thing to do or an appropriate thing to do. I was talking to Graham before, you know, electricity is an interesting one at the moment because there's so much change going on. I think if you were going to do it, it would be because, like that's the, the coal powered um, gas fired, all that stuff is sort of looking like yesterday's investment. You're probably looking at the loss of quite a lot of money as the the the, um, the private owners are currently um, reducing the, the value on their books of their coal fired assets. The thing that we're missing at the moment, the thing that we've got with the electricity and energy generally, the bit that we, we don't have, and we I don't think you can do it without there being one entity is planning, right? We've got system change. We can't get a reliable grid. That's what happened in Texas. That's what keeps happening here in our summers because the private market can't deliver to deliver an assured system that moves us towards green energy. You keep getting these massive failures and you can't expect a private market priced, up, priced on today to make a decision that's going to be helpful for us in the future. So that's one area. There are other areas, I don't know whether I'd be too worried about renationalizing Qantas, but Graham's point, and I think, um, Osman's point was in some ways more profound. Some, sometimes the question is maybe we've corporatized things inappropriately. Maybe they should never have been moved down to corporate parts in public ownership, but they should have had a public service ethos. And that when you move, when you corporatize them, you lost that sense. <clears throat> in, in some ways, we chucked, the, we, we chucked the engineers out, put the finances in front. In some cases, it probably would have been better to have chosen sociologists to run them instead. Um, <clears throat> but you get my point. And then you've got the issue of the regulatory structures. Graham quite rightly points out all the re research on regulatory structures. The trouble is the working out what the right regulatory structure is has become really, really difficult. Um, the t more time goes on, the more it looks like if it, 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 you can't do a completely easy risk-based regulatory structure, we'll leave this alone because it's not risky. Um, in public services, you just can't do it. You get one person who is... Um, sexually assaulted, uh, one person who dies is one person too many. Um, it, you know, the, so it, it's complex thinking about how, what you want to bring back into a public, it's really about what's a public service or a care ethic. How, how do you bring it back into that? That's how I prefer it to be cast rather than, rather than the other way, which is privatization, renationalization. I just think it's a little bit more complex. Can I, can I say something? Can I join in? 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think on that last point, one of the things that we've, there's been a bit of discussion online, but I think, you know, there's the, one of the problems that we haven't really talked about is, I mean, you've got privatisation and you've got government ownership and you've got the private, you know, the uh, market sector versus the public sector. And I think a lot of this forgets that part of this process is actually referring stuff back to the community. It's the funding of community services. And there's a whole lot of movements of bottom up community service push beginning to come here and overseas. And I think we need to go back and look at issues like co-ops, like local things, like sort of having government, co not control, but supervision, but locally run services. You get it in all the indigenous stuff. That's what they're all arguing for. And I think if we start looking at different ways of managing the community services so the users actually have a say so that they are participating in the process <laughs> then you get away from the oversized bureaucracies which are one of the reasons i think the privatization took off because we had a whole lot of bureaucracies that were not doing all that well in the 70s and so on but to get the idea that you know that community services and a lot of other services should be locally run and managed by the people that they're serving to some degree with some supervision to make sure that they don't make stupid mistakes and to make sure that there's some sort of national coordination and various other things. And I think that fits very comfortably with a lot of the sort of left stuff that we've forgotten about. Get away from the idea of just having to have the big government and big corporations and get back to the fact that what we're on about really is making sure that the people who get essential services don't get priced out of the market in a sense, that it's not a price issue, it's about your entitlement. And I think that's the thing. So one of the things I've just sort of mentioned briefly in one of the notes is you've got this big campaign at the moment called Thrive Till Five, which is run by Jay Wetherill with funding by uh, Twiggy Forest. And Twiggy Forest runs private childcare services, yet that particular campaign is not talking about privatization. I've challenged him a couple of times to raise the issue of privatization. So, and that's one of the Labour Party's ex-premiers. So, I mean, I just think there's a whole lot of issues that need to be discussed around privatisation, particularly around childcare and aged care, because you can't run it from Canberra. You can't run it from a central thing. It's got to be run within the community and you've got to make sure that they don't exclude people they consider undesirable. That's the only problem you have with some community services, but that's handleable. So, I mean, maybe I think, you know, the progressive side of politics needs to go back to the idea of community and society and the social and the things there and, and, the, and the local controls, not controlled by government, but funded by government in a way that ensures that they can deliver the essential services to people in the way they want them and to meet the needs they have, not some fantasy about making money. That, that's a great point, Eva. Can I, can I just before perhaps we go to Graham and David, um, as I think a similar sort of point or similar question was also asked by Shan Turnbull. Mm. Um, and I just wonder if Shan, if she's there or he, <laughs> would like he. to, he would like to um, unmute and just uh, contribute your question or comments into that. Because I, th I think you're on the similar theme. Is that right? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me all right there? Yeah, and I'd just like to support Eva, and I was just typing a message to her in the chat session that could, would she like to encourage the Fabian executive to reframe the question of localization and uh, uh, the care ethic and the regulatory structure on a bottom up basis? And there's mm. no graduate school of management and public administration in the world that teaches bottom up governance. Yet mm. a Nobel Prize was issued in 2009 to Eleanor Ostrom, who said uh, pre modern societies like Australian trade uh, Aborigines have been practicing it for thousands of years. Mm. And this is, and, and we need this urgently to manage complexity. And the system scientists know that you cannot regulate if you're a CEO. You're living in a cocoon of ignorance at the top. It doesn't matter if you're in the public or private sector, you don't know what's happening down on the grassroots. And what you need is stakeholder regulation from the bottom up. And the, it, it, because of Brexit, the, uh, the UK Parliament League Committee of Treasurer and Her Majesty's Treasury invited submissions of how should they regulate now they're not subject to the EU. And the Sheriff of London has published my paper on that 
which is talking about enriching democracy as at the same time as increasing the quality of regulation. And we have all these royal commissions all the time because it's, to it's the toxic problem of command and control hierarchies. We've got to have community-based and might uh, Eva and your colleagues on the uh, Fabian uh, group uh, reframe it so you can get the support of uh, the other side of the aisle because they've got a problem. It's, it's, it's a problem of toxic hierarchies. And if we want to stop extinction of humanity on this planet to manage the complexity of, of uh, global degradation, we've got to involve everybody from the bottom up to do their bit like they have in the pandemic. So does that sort of start things off a bit for you, Chair? Yeah, that's great. The, thank, thanks very much for, for, for the two of you for, for introducing that uh, theme into, into this conversation. So. Um, David and Graham, would you, would you like to um, comment? Let, let, let me buy in. So, fantastic comment, uh, Shan, and also Eva. In fact, the missing element from most regulators in most sectors is their need to not only do bottom-up listening and get advice from uh, local communities and, dare I say, citizens and their own customers, but it's to get them out of their own kind of technocratic um, vacuum uh, contexts. Most regulators uh, uh, suffer, in my view, a problem of sort of being overly te technocratic. I remember having long debates with the ESC in their early days when I was saying, you know, what are you doing about subsidies for, um, uh, for the poor? And they would say, oh, look, that's government policy um, and it's nothing to do with us. And I would sort of laugh at them saying, well, hang on, how do you interpret government policy? Oh, we don't interpret government policy. We're just economists. So there is this ridiculously circuitous way of avoiding taking responsibility for anything that was not in, in their kind of economic textbook. So I think there's two issues. One is the bottom up, the need for bottom up advice. And some regulators have had have instituted a capacity for bottom up advice, but most haven't. Right. The second thing is I, I do think, and I feel very strongly, uh, David, as a kind of a throwaway line, said perhaps we ought to have less economists and, or imply that, and, uh, and more sociologists. It, I wish more historians worked in government organisations because the, the rate at which we fail to learn from history just astounds me. Right? We keep making the same stupid mistakes so often that it's kind of bordering on embarrassing as if history doesn't matter. There's entire disciplines that write about path dependency, how, how tomorrow's actions are really driven by our assumptions of what we've been doing for the last 20 years and the bad habits we've been getting into. We just keep doing the same stuff. So part of it is also about, I think, getting out of your own uh, technocratic discipline. And that involves, that involves new approaches from um, regulators. I, I would go back to... Um, the original comment that was made about corporatisation, competitive neutrality and so on. I think if you read uh, Niskanen's work at the ultimate public choice economist that David was reading at before, corporatisation was regarded as one step between the problem that we have at the moment, you know, the problem is government, as Reagan said, through to Nirvana, which was a privatised world in the, in the minds of a bunch of public choice economists in the US. Corporatisation was always a kind of a, just a, a handy step along the way. No one or very few people said, I was one of the people in electricity that said, hang on, why do you have to privatise? Why don't you have the old SECV that simply knows how much it costs and does this kind of in-house trading and knows how much electricity costs elsewhere? Why does the whole show have to be turned into a complex market? And the answer was, because that's our assumption. We're all about markets. We're not about just knowing prices. So there is a there is a slavery to one discipline running um, economic markets. I suspect there's also a slavery to other disciplines being um, perhaps finance disciplines in running uh, some other areas. I wouldn't lose hope because I do see hope. And on this nationalisation of of uh, hospitals, I'm glad uh, Sean said um, that. There are lots of hospitals, there's prisons, there's um, all sorts of things that have been nationalised. Um, there is evidence around to say that it's sensible, but I'd also say to people, it's got to be horses for courses, doesn't it? You know, when, when, we, 
when we didn't get the promised $1.8 billion savings on franchise trains in Victoria, governments had the chance to take the trains back and the trams. They didn't. So there are political judgments to be made along the way. I'd say some things are sensible to bring back in-house uh, just through uh, political judgments that, that um, need to be made at the time. But there is a, a complete lack, and I agree totally with David, there is a complete lack of planning values. We've thrown planning out as if all planning is wrong. That's just a complete load of garbage, I'm sorry. The reason why some many private projects, infrastructure projects get put in easily today is because governments have been planning the rights of way, been planning uh, for the possibility of those projects for the last five or six decades. So something has to be done on the, the planning front and something has to be done on the, the reinstituting, I guess, for, for want of a better phrase, public values values that are not just the values that the economists running a, a division or the techno technocrats running a particular um, department. Thanks, Graham. David, you want to... Uh, look, I think it's a really good idea that's been put on the table for, for the Fabians to pursue, which is really to set up a new agenda rather than going back and having a debate that was lost at yesterday's. I think it's a really pressing one because of the... Two things. One is that there's the worry about the impact of social media, the you know the um, Facebook and etc. on the damage it's done to communities, if you like. And where where do we go? I think a, a lot of people are very worried about that. The the, the fake news, the anti vaxxers the, the all that stuff that's come through and it's fractured and caused new alignments based on you know ethnicities and class and stuff. That I think that needs to be, that's part of the thing, I think, Eva. And I can see how that could work through nicely with a care economy push that was localised. I think all that would be really good. And by the way, Victoria has just now recognised the care, care economy as something, and that in itself is a great thing. Mm. Um, but the other thing I was going to mention, which just to throw it in, I don't know where it fits, but I've been fascinated at the resurgence in trust in government uh, after the COVID response in Australia. Something very heartening in there about that. And that was against the federal government didn't want to didn't want Victoria to do what it did or didn't want the states to do what it what they did, which was to turn their back on business interests to promote mm -hmm. a health ethic. It was liked by people, very, very popular. And even even um, Morrison's had to change his tune. So somewhere there's something about that too, I think, to be thinking about Chan. And, and I just say on that Eva, one because but, yeah. yeah, that's the I mean, I've been following those particular Edelman things like that. They've shot up furiously, and I think they shot up. And the various governments were returned when they were standing for election in those things, because for once we would put government back where it used to be, which was the managing mm. of a crisis and managing it fairly effectively, despite some of the best efforts of the federal government. Mm. And I'm just wondering, one of the things, because this is the stuff I did in my boy lectures, but, you know, look of trust. But the thing is, it's been very suddenly up. And I think the way that SCOMO is going at the moment of trying to say, oh, well, the public sector will fix everything and the cutbacks on welfare and the various other things, that we might find a sudden sinking of mm -hmm. that trust again, because it went up very rapidly. If we, will, we don't we actually manage to put up some optimistic alternatives, which mm -hmm. don't move us back to the mess that we were in before it all started. And that's one of the things that's come through very clearly. And that's interesting because what's his name, has just published the book, uh, Ross Scarno, is saying mm -hmm. we can't go back to what we had because it was a mess. And so I think that, you know, if we want to retain trust, some of this stuff would actually catch people's sense that there are possibilities out there which are neither the overdone market nor the overdone bureaucracy, you know. Thanks very much to everybody that, that's um, contributed to that discussion and questions and answers. Um, we've now, I think, reached the, the, the time to, to actually close the um, formal meeting. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. And um, I suppose from my point of view, it's always good when, um, you know, you, you, you come away with a lot of new insights. It wasn't, you know, you didn't just hear all the things that you expected to hear. And that kind of you already knew before you came along, um, but uh, really had had our minds opened up to, in a sense, really the complexity of, of this issue and the nuances and so on. So, so thank you to our speakers and thanks to um, uh, all everyone who's come. And, and we we haven't been able to 
let everyone sort of actually have the floor to ask their questions, but it's all in the chat there. I'm sure we've all been reading the chat um, and, and that's been very rich as, as well. Um, so what I am going to do now is to move on to the next um, stage of the evening, which is to, um, to pass uh, the baton to um, the, the chair of the uh, Victorian branch. I'm acting chair while Julia Thornton um, uh, is, is uh, recuperating from some medical procedures. But um, Julia is, is actually the, the chair. Um, and um, I'll pass you over to her in just one second, just also to note that we will be putting the video of this event and the other events um, onto our website. So you can watch it again. And I think you almost need to really because there's so much richness in there. Um, so I'll hand over to Julia to take us to the next stage in the meeting.